All right. So when we left off last time, we were able to submit our form and able to you know count the responses to these poll questions. So that's cool. Um, but the first thing that's missing here is that there's no CSS for our site. So we need to talk uh, really quickly about how to add CSS, how to add static files into, uh, into our application. So first, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to create a folder for static files. Um, so this is going to be independent of any one app in my project. It's possible that you know we'll have a logo for our application for our project, and then many different apps might use the same logo for one example. So we're going to have a static directory called static. Uh, right here at the root of our project. And inside of that, I'm gonna make some subfolders for different types of files that might be requested, such as CSS. And then inside of there, I'm gonna make a file main.css. So ideally, I would like, um, I wanna see the body get this background color red. That's how I'll know that I'm loading in my style sheet correctly. So what I need to know now, well, first let's go to the index.html, add a link tag. Style sheet. So what is the href now um, for my link tag? That's my next question here. So I need to figure out um, what URL I can request in order to receive that CSS file. So Django does have like kind of built-in defaults for where you can put your static files and what URL you can use to request them. I think those defaults are kind of weird and ask you to do a lot of work for something that's not actually super useful. We'll see more when we get to um, React and as we get to deploying our Django applications that we're gonna to have to reorganize our static files in kind of a different way than um, what Django suggests in the tutorial. So I'm uh, using this kind of different organizational pattern because I think it's simpler overall and it's more similar to what we're gonna need down the road. So I think this is just kind of easier all around doing things this way. Um, I have my static folder outside of the app, outside of the project. Uh, right next to the manage.py. Inside of that, there's the CSS, main.css. So what I want to do now is go to my settings file, and I need to tell Django um, where it can serve static files from. So there is some default setting that I don't think is very smart. So I'm just going to override it. Uh, I don't remember how to do this offhand, so I just Googled for Django static files. Here's my Google search, Django static files. Very top result is their official documentation. And you can see there's a few different ways to do this, which is common in Django. There's many ways to do things. You got to figure out what's right for your situation. But this is what I'm looking for. So I'm going to put this into my settings.py, and this is going to specify what folder um, Django will serve static files from that right there. So base there slash static. So what's base directory? So that's defined up at the top. Um, it's just the location of this file, the settings.py, but then goes to the parent's parent. So out of the uh, polls project, and then should be looking like in this folder. Um, that's the base directory. And so then I'm saying my static folder is just in the base directory slash static. And then I don't even need that. So this is how I tell Django that my static files are right in here in static. And then here I've declared static URL. This is saying that this is what the client can request 
in order to access our static files. I know this is like a little bit confusing, just what the client is requesting, what the server is expecting. I would definitely recommend you guys play around with this on your own in order to get a sense for how static files work, how you can organize things, how you can't. Um, so this is the URL where the client can send requests to ask for static files. And this is a directory where we will serve static files from. So this is saying if we get a request that starts with static, then we're gonna assume that they're asking for something inside of the folder called static. So if we get a request to, for example, static slash CSS slash main.css, that should refer to this file inside of our static folder. So I'll put that here in the page ref. I only loaded this on the home page, so I have to go there. And now we see it. Looks like I have successfully loaded my CSS file in. And so now I'm, I'm getting this red background. Um, so that's cool, that worked. So if I need to make uh, JavaScript files accessible to clients, I'll do that in kind of a similar way. Images, do that in kind of a similar way. Just make more subfolders in here. No. Something like that. Um, but so now the problem that I'm seeing is that my styles are only applied in the index. And maybe this is like base styles or, you know, if it's bootstrap, for example, I want to put this in every file. So I need to find um, some smarter ways to avoid duplicating code. That's kind of the next thing that we're going to cover. Um, but before we move on, does anyone have any questions about how I'm managing the static files here? Michael? Yeah, so I, just, I got a question. So in settings.py, it says that the static URL is, you know, static slash. Mm -hmm. So how come in the um, index HTML, we have to still put static slash in the href? instead of just like CSS main. Well, how does it know that we're looking for static files? Oh, okay, I get you. Okay, yeah. so that's just, okay, so this part where it says static tag is just telling the static URL where to look for it in the static directories. Right here, maybe if we actually made these different words, it would be more clear. Um, so this was, And then in the index HTML, we're going to look for some files. Cool. And so that still works exactly the same way. Still able to access the main.css. So here we're saying that this is a URL that a client can request. And then if they do request this, um, anything after this part of the URL we're going to assume that's a folder or a file in our static directory, which where's our static directory? It's base dir slash static. So if a user asks for, give me some static files slash CSS slash main.css, the server is going to look for that in base dir slash static slash CSS slash main.css. Sound good? Kind of? Yeah, that makes sense. It's definitely a little weird. Um, so give me some static is in static, right? 
that's what you just said. Um, this is just a URL that a user can request to access um, our static files in this folder. I don't actually have any files oh, on the server okay. called give me some static files cool. or a folder or anything with that name. Um, do we have other questions before we move on? All right, let us continue. So now I wanna talk about some intermediate templating. Starting with include. So sometimes you'll have a piece of HTML that you want to copy into multiple different templates. So this might be called a partial because it's not a full HTML file, but it's just a part of an HTML file. Um, So for an example, let's say, um, you know, I have a newsletter or whatever for my polls app and I want people to subscribe to it. I might have that kind of subscribe button on every page of my site. So maybe it looks a little bit like this. Um, So something like that, that could be a button that, you know, maybe we have on every page of our site because we want to make sure people subscribe. But I wouldn't want to copy and paste the same code multiple times because A, that's extra effort. But also if the button changes in the future, then I have to change it on every page where it appears. And that creates the possibility for errors because I might forget it in one place. So I would like to define this once and then copy it everywhere else that it's needed. So what I'm gonna do is in my templates here, I'm gonna create a new one, subscribe.html. Cool, so I just cut the content out, put that in there. And then instead of putting the actual button, I'm gonna use another Django template tag. And we will include And so now we can see that it behaves the same way. We still have the subscribe button on the page. But now I can also add the same button to my other pages by just including it. And I no longer um, have to copy that actual HTML. So here we got the subscribe button. We go, what's up? Still have a subscribe button, a vote, and there's another subscribe button. It's the exact same button. If I need to change it, um, all I have to do is change the partial here itself. And that changes the button everywhere else it appears on my site. So that is include. Uh, hopefully this one shouldn't be too crazy complicated, but let's stop the questions now before we move on. There's just one more topic.
Can you show the code for the include again? And is that include the same uh, method that we imported for when we use it in other places in the non non HTML files? Um, that's a good question, actually. I think it's not. Um, where did we do that? Was that in what the maybe curses that ask it? Get out of here. Um, I'm not really sure where that came from. Um, was it in URLs? Not this URLs, but URLs. Okay, yeah. So in the URLs.py, there is a function that we import from Django.urls called include, which is how we add in um, like a group of routes to our URL patterns. But that is unrelated to what we're doing now. It's just kind of an unfortunate coincidence that both of these features use the same word. Um, but yeah, in our templates, uh, this is a different include that only works in templates. It's not the same as the include function that you see in the routes. So this is just for getting one template inside of another template. Um, and this is actually a concept that exists outside of Django. Lots of templating systems in other languages as well are gonna have this concept of include and then also extends, which is the next thing I'm about to show you. Jake? So if you wanted like a, a nav bar on every single one of your pages, that's something you can just put in um, static and then do the include in like all, all of the templates? Or is there a way to just say like, for every single page I have, I want, this nav bar to be on there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really good question. So, so for one thing, I wouldn't put it in static. The nav bar would still be a template. It would have some data that gets passed in to render it. So it would be in the templates folder. But uh, what you're saying is that like with what I know now with include, I could add the nav bar in you know, every page, just like, The nav bar or whatever, but that would get still even a little bit redundant. I would be including that on every file in the same place in every file. So given that um, I would be using include in the same, I'm sorry, I would be using the nav bar in every file in the same place in every file, there is a more elegant way that we can describe our layout using a concept called extends. Uh, and I think I had one more question, and then I want to show you extends. Yeah, Raphael, I had a question. Um, just, just curious, are, do you generally break up the CSS files? Like you break up these individual HTML elements that you're going to reuse, yeah. or do they just all draw off the one main CSS page? So ideally, if your website has a cohesive sense of style, most of the elements on your website should share the same styles. They should have similar borders and padding, similar colors. So you can probably get away with using one style sheet for like 80 to 90% of your styles. Now, beyond that, you're probably gonna have some situations where one page requires a few unique styles. And so you can create a style sheet that's unique to that page. But commonly I'll get most of my styles just in one global style sheet. Do we have more questions? I'm still, so like when you made that button, you put it in static, right? Like the actual element tag or the, the tags for buttons. It's in templates. Oh, okay. Never mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Static is just files that never change. That's what static means. So just like my CSS file, um, this doesn't change depending on who requests it it's the same CSS file that every user gets. Okay, got it. For some reason, I thought you created the button in static and then like did include for each one of the templates, but mm -hmm. oh, never mind. Yeah, not quite.
on that on that same note if you so if you're so if you're going to use your images static is that only if they're files from a computer like if you were just trying to link to a file you got off google images are you still going to put it in the static or would you just use the link um yeah if it's like on the internet somewhere you can just use a link to public um url like that's how we're going to load in bootstrap um so we'll use the bootstrap CDN. They give you this HTTPS URL. This isn't in my static folder. This is on the uh, JS deliver CDN. Cool. So yeah, my files that I wrote are gonna be in static and they're gonna be uh, included like so, but plenty of files won't be, that's fine. Um, like external files will have external URLs. All right, so we've got a lot of duplicate code here, you know, the head, body, or whatever. What I want to do is define one HTML element or one HTML file for my layout. It's going to have all of the common elements. And then in that uh, layout, I'm going to define some blocks, which are kind of like empty placeholders that my other HTML files will fill. So we're going to make a new file here, so layout.html. So this is going to have HTML, head, body. Uh, we're going to put a header on here. So every page is going to have this header. And then we're going to have a block. So note that here, this block is empty and that's just fine because the layout doesn't define the content. It's just saying that this is where the content goes. So other templates will define content that gets inserted in here. Uh, but we can also define blocks with uh, default content. So a good example is the title. Um, every page of your website should have a title. So for SEO purposes, every page of your site should have a title, but it's very likely that like 95% of your pages will have the same title. So here, Defining a block. But this block has default content. So if we try to load a template that doesn't specify the title, then we're going to use this title instead. Because we want to make sure that every page has a title. So now in my other pages, I no longer have to include this information, the head, body, and the title. I just have to have the unique content that's specific to this page. Um, so I'm looking at my index HTML, we're gonna get the style sheet out of here that belongs in the layout. And don't need HTML, head, body, dent these. Uh, this heading was put into the layout, so we don't need that anymore. Uh, 
So now this is the actual content that I want inserted into my layout. I just need to specify where it goes. So this bunch of code here, this is the content. Let's, yeah, I'll just leave it like that for now. Um, excuse me. Do you need to extend uh, the layout? Uh, probably. Okay, yeah, uh, somehow I forgot to put this in the notes, but this is definitely essential. Um, I need to specify which template this is extending, because I could potentially have multiple different layouts. Um, in this case, I only have one, but maybe you have you know one, log one layout for logged in users and then a different layout for users that are not logged in, maybe, I don't know. Um, Extends layout of HTML. There, amazing. Um, so now I've specified that this template, index HTML, is not a complete HTML file, but it extends. Um, the layout HTML file. So in order to understand how this renders, I've got to see like, okay, it extends layout HTML and we have a block for content. So I'm gonna look at layout HTML and say, oh, here's block content. So I'm gonna imagine that the contents of index HTML goes right over here. And then here's block title. Well, index HTML didn't specify a title. So it's gonna just default to this title. And that's what we see up in the top is welcome to the polls. Um, so now let's do the same thing to our other pages. Uh, this is the detail page. Just gonna copy these guys. So yeah, here we're on the first page. We can click a question, check out what's new. And we go to the detail page for the question. And this one also has the red background. I didn't have to include my CSS multiple times because both the detail page and the index page are extending layout. And the layout has my CSS file included. Um, and then also we can see that the title is different on this page. 
because the details page has overridden the default title block with its own custom title block, uh, which we see right around here. And uh, yeah, so that is extensible layout, basically. What questions do we have? Uh, I just want to get a handle on the syntax. Can you go to the layout.html file? So here you have uh, on line four, the block title, and then on line six, end block. Mm -hmm. So the block and title are both keywords, or is it just block that's a keyword? Title is not a keyword. You can name your blocks anything you want. Okay, but block and, and, and block are what we need to, to uh, worry about, right? Or are the keywords that we, that we use to identify where we start and end? Right. Yeah, right. Okay. And then it looks like it's the same syntax in the, in the file that extends. The only difference is that at the top we have, we're telling it that this is what we're extending, what file we're extending. Is that correct? Okay. Yeah, kind of like one difference though is that the blocks in the layout will generally be empty or they might have content in them for default content. Okay. But in the other files, the content of the blocks, this is the actual content that you want to get inserted. So you need to have something in here or it's going to use the default value from the layout or nothing. Okay. Like Thanks. in this case. Uh, what other questions have we got? Questions, anybody? Um, yeah, I have a question, but it's backtracked a little bit. Um, when, how did you, could you show us again how it is that you link the URLs from your app into your project? Because I know in your project URLs, you linked it to the app URLs, correct? Yeah. So in my project, Pulse project, start at urls.py, click my table of contents. Um, currently, we only have one chapter, let's say, in our table of contents. They're saying we've got a whole bunch of stuff at polls. Um, so this is a URL that we can handle, polls slash whatever slash whatever. And those are all being handled by uh, the pollsapp.urls file. So polls app is this folder here, this Python module. Uh, URLs is inside of it, urls.py. And so here, this is showing a more specific set of URLs that we're prepared to handle, such as polls, polls slash ID, polls ID results, polls ID vote, um, and these are the functions that handle those. So views.index um, from dot import views. So dot is the same folder. We imported this views file, which should have a function in it called index. And that's this guy right here. So this gets the request object, do a little processing, put some data into a template, and then send the response to the user. Thank you. You're welcome. What other questions have we got? Justin had a good question. If you have any VS code extensions you'd recommend for Django or, you know, kind of utilities like that. Mm -hmm. 
So I just did a quick look. Apparently they exist. Um, it looks like there is specifically something that helps with Django templates. Uh, I'm gonna install this. I have no idea what it does. Which is generally not a good habit, but I did it. And I guess it's colored a little bit differently now. So that's nice. Um, seems like it's aware that like there's special syntax that for and in are keywords, whereas that choice and question choices are not. I'm a fan. That is nice. I guess it's cool. I'm probably not going to uninstall it at this point. Um, I just don't really use extensions too much in VS Code. I feel like a lot of people get lost in just configuring their editor and they don't actually spend enough time like writing code. Um, and also I've just switched editors so many times at this point that I've like wasted enough time configuring editors. Whereas like the time I've spent learning to code is much less of a waste than it feels like. For sure. That, that's a really good point. It really is a rabbit hole and it's, it's a fine line. Like kind of what I've come to is like, if I can get my editor to help me with things that humans are bad at, like identifying typos, then that's good. But other than that, um, especially when learning, I think you have to be careful. Um, yeah, definitely though, if you know you're bad at something, if there is something that repeatedly gives you grief and causes you to waste time, you should ask yourself, like, there's gotta be a better way to do this and then look for solutions for that. So, you know, for sure, if you have a hard time reading these Django templates and you feel like you lose a lot of time on that, you know, maybe I would look for an extension and I find one and it highlights things for me. And so great, that solves a personal problem that I might've been having. Um, and in this case, I think it's a nice extension because syntax highlighting is pretty useful and very low complexity. Like I don't have to know how this works really. It just kind of colors things automatically in a pretty useful way. Um, whereas other extensions, you know, can maybe dramatically change your dev environment and maybe they don't play nicely with other extensions and then things get weird after a while. So I try to minimize the number of extensions I use unless they're very useful and low complexity. Yeah, I don't, uh, yeah, extensions get kind of crazy, but I, I just like to, I like extensions that help with uncomfortable keystrokes like doing an open bracket, percent sign, percent sign, close bracket. Like if it just like, you know, kind of gave me the other half of that so I didn't have to uncomfortably manage keystrokes, that's, you know, just things like that is, is kind of nice. Um, so for that, you don't even need an extension for that. You can just get like snippets are basically what they're called. Yeah. Okay. Um, so it looks like Django provides you some, but I would never think to do that. I would just make my own. Just if you know that there's something you type out a whole bunch, you can create a little like keyboard shortcut for yourself. So yeah. like there was a time when I used to write lots of HTML boilerplate and I got kind of sick of doing that millions of times over. So I created a little keyboard shortcut for myself. I just type comma HTML and then hit tab and it replaces that with an entire HTML uh, boilerplate, including a title tag with my cursor uh, right in between the opening and closing tag. Because that was very useful to me at a certain point in my career. I don't write so much like HTML boilerplate anymore that I think I've like forgotten about that shortcut and on a computer I don't use anymore. Um, but that's definitely a thing you can do. It's really easy in Vim because Vim is all about remapping your keyboard. So you can just press any series of keys and have it do whatever you want. Um, but lots of editors also have like built-in support for snippets. Yeah, I use the macros a lot for similar reasons. And like you, I went through a phase of like lots of editor configuring. Um, and now, I mean, there are a couple of things I like that I keep, but I've gotten pretty lazy about it. Um, but it, it depends again, what, what you're doing. And, and everyone has their own approach kind of too, as, as you're seeing, and everyone kind of figure out what's work, what works for them. And like, I know, I think it was Skylar's using PyCharm and I'm a fan of IntelliJ stuff. Um, 
I, I don't use too much of the fancy s- stuff they provide you. Um, I think the one thing is for technical interviews, just be aware, you know, um, I don't remember the name of these services, but it, you know, you may be doing it through an online service like Leak Code or something where you've got a browser window and that browser window has like a little text editor in there, but you're not gonna have all the extensions that you're used to, um, especially for Python and JavaScript. Um, that's just something to be mindful of when learning and then especially during interview prep. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I apologize if that was a little off off track. No, you're good. Just where my my head right. Um, question, Rafael. What's up? What are some alternatives to using Django? Because I hate Django. <laughs> um, so other server side frameworks. So if you want to stay in Python, there is Flask, which is another server side framework in Python. It's much simpler though than Django. Um, so it's typically used for smaller applications. Um, if you want to be a full stack JavaScript developer, <coughs> if you love JS and just want to use it on your server, Express is the most popular um, node or JavaScript based server framework. Um, if you like Ruby and Rails, well, there's Rails. I just want to put my two cents in for Rails. Mm-hmm. I think it's like an amazing and mature framework. Um, obviously you have to like be working in Ruby and want to work in Ruby. Um, but it was, I've also never worked with Django, but I've worked with rails and they, they have a lot of similarities. I've never used rails, but I always thought of it as a framework for unpretentious people to just get work done. Um, yeah, it just, it makes a lot of stuff really easy. It does have a lot more magic, I will say, like even relative to Django. Yeah, there's like a spectrum of frameworks. Some are more magical, some are less magical. So like Flask is very unmagical. It does exactly what you tell it to and little else. Um, Whereas Django is trying to save you a bunch of effort and it does a whole bunch of stuff automatically, kind of assuming that you're trying to solve a very large problem. Uh, so if for some reason you find yourself in the PHP world, it's a very good chance that you're going to be using Laravel as your server side framework. Uh, this is pretty dominant these days. Apparently Twitch is built with Laravel. Uh, who knew? Um, if you're in the Microsoft world, you're probably going to be using C as your server side framework. Uh, so this is also kind of similar to like Django and Rails. It's very mature, very sophisticated, solves a big problem for you. A lot of magic probably. Um, but I've never used .NET before. I've never used .NET either. Um, I know some folks who do and they really like it. And, and I'm kind of... I think once you get some experience and you do the same kind of thing like four or five times, then you're kind of like, all right, I'm ready for a framework that has some magic and like solves these problems well. And it seems like .NET does that really well. Yeah, Um, so again, I've never used it, but everyone that I've heard of using it says only good things about uh, C-sharp.net. If for whatever reason, you know, you went to, computer science school in the 80s and you're writing Java full-time now. Um, Spring is probably the server-side framework you're gonna use with Java. I don't think I've heard of anyone using anything else in Java for like 10 years. So I guess this is a very popular Java server framework. Um, Sure, there are others I'm forgetting. These are popular ones. Phoenix, that's that's kind of like niche and trendy and amazing. Is that for Elixir? Yeah. Uh, Sorry. Right. I, I only did a little with it, but I really liked the language and it has a special place in, in my heart. Okay. Um, 
it's a lot like Rails, to be honest, in terms of, of the framework. Um, hmm, interesting. Uh, oh, you know, while we're on the subject, there's, there's one framework I want to talk about just for a minute, because I think this is hilarious. Um, so like, I don't know, like 10 years ago, Meteor was a popular framework. So it was when uh, full stack apps were becoming like a trendy thing or that full stack developers were a trendy thing. You could have one person building the front end and the back end. And full stack JavaScript was becoming a thing with JavaScript on the front end and um, Express on the back end. And some people got this brilliant idea that what if we just had a full stack framework? It doesn't even try to separate front end from back end. You just write one code base and that it runs everywhere. Um, so at some level that just like doesn't make sense. Like the front end and the back end run on different machines. So like they are different code bases. Like, so at some level this like doesn't actually work the way it's advertised, but it's a very magical framework that lets you pretend like you're accessing the server from your front end. Um, so some people liked it for a while because it makes uh, development a lot simpler if you just do things the meteor way. I never really liked it because it felt like too magical, like combining the front and the back end. I'm sure there's all kinds of security concerns that are harder to think about because like meteor doesn't even show you the difference between the front and the back end. So obviously, but I think what really, what really killed it was over time, um, it just got outdated. It, was, it had some dependencies on like older projects and like they didn't update Meteor. So some people in the community decided that they wanted a more modern version of Meteor. And so they forked the project and renamed it. Um, and this is probably the worst name for um, a programming framework I've ever heard of. And I believe confidently that this name was so bad that it um, immediately killed all interest in the framework. Dingleberry. Oh, Meteor. <laughs> yeah, this oh, guy. Bad. Um, Meteor, a Meteor alternative. So, because the thing is like the original Meteor was one of those like super hip trendy kinds of frameworks that like people want to talk about at, um, meetups you know you just like go to meetup drink beer eat some pizza talk with some random developers and like oh what tech stack are you using like i'm on csharp.net or i'm on ruby on rails and someone might be like oh i'm using meteor and <laughs> you might say like oh i was using that five years ago how is it these days no no i'm not using meteor i'm using meteor like meaty meteor medius and then people would just give you stupid looks and then probably go talk to someone else. Um, so yeah, I, it's like a really funny pun when you just read it in text and is absolutely impossible to talk about. So I'm pretty sure that people just stop talking about it for that reason. I, yeah, I have never seen this and, and I don't want to stereotype, but I have to imagine the people that came up with the name were all young dudes. And yes. yeah, like, there's a lot of weird names in, in tech, but if you're talking with your product manager or like the VP of product about how you want to like refactor the web app and you're like, we're going to use the Meteor framework, that's not going to fly. And it's a great example of why you don't want like all young dudes doing everything. Yeah, yeah it's just programmers or just even programmers. So yeah, that's my story. A uh, lot of hilarious and terrible names for technologies that I've seen, and this is probably the worst one. Uh, on that note, don't think I have any other, well, do people have more questions? Sorry, I feel like I've just been rambling for a bit. Could you just show again how you um, how you linked the the details to the layout, like the detail, the results? So, 
So the detail page, um, this is you know not a complete HTML page. We don't see the HTML tag, head or, or body tags, but it extends uh, pulls abstract layout.html. Let's actually get a two column layout, see this a little more easily. So did you put that same tag at the top of all of them? The extends? Mm -hmm. Yeah, every HTML partial that is extending this file needs to have this at the top of it. Okay. Um, and so for the details got it, results should have it if I was gonna continue building this. Mm -hmm. HTML's got it, um, but subscribe does not because this is just a button. It's not supposed to be a page. Mm -hmm. So in the layout, do they each have to have different names or is there just the one spot in the layout? So I see that just said, okay. So they, so for each one, it does have to have a different name with the block. Yeah. When okay. you're just starting out, you might only have one block, but in theory, you can have as many as you want. You know, content is probably the first one, maybe title if that changes on some, but not all pages. Um, you might have a block for the footer if that's different on different pages but then you can still have a default footer. Sound good? Thank you. Yep, yep. thank cool. you. Uh, do we have other questions? Um, is there anything that you haven't covered that we're going to need to know how to do for tonight's assignment? Uh, I don't think so. What are, okay. you doing? what are you even doing tonight? In the in tonight's assignments, I saw that the CSVs were converter, converted into JSONs. Um, is that going to mess up the function about opening the CSV files if it's in JSON format instead of CSV? Um, where are you reading? And data, they got converted from CSV to JSONs, but then inside the classes, when it goes into opening up the data, I think it's in class person. It opens it up using a CSV, I believe. Uh, yeah, we should update that. Um, so definitely just replace all this code with uh, similar code that reads the JSON files. In theory, okay, that should okay. be much, much simpler. It's just like one line of code to read the JSON file, which was why we replaced them. Cause we don't need to be, we don't mean to be hassling you about CSV files, like nonstop for the rest of the program. Like we covered it, great. Um, now we're gonna do things in an easier way. Could you show us that easier way? These sites are disliked the least. Jeez. Docs, here we go. Uh, so yeah, it's built into Python, but you do have to import it. So we'll import the JSON module. And then it's got two, um, two methods that we need to worry about. Um, so yeah, json.dumps, you give that any uh, a list or a dictionary or a list of dictionaries, dictionary of lists. And you pass that in and then return, and then it returns a string of JSON representing that data. And then the flip side of that is JSON.loads, where you give it a string of JSON data and it returns an actual Python data structure, like list of dictionaries, et cetera that uh, represents that JSON string. So this should be much simpler, just one line of code for either direction. I imagine we still have to like open the file. In the normal way. Is there mica? Oh, I um, let's see. There might be a shortcut you can take. Let's see what Geeks for Geeks says. So 
So it looks like, so let's see, I showed you, see, I did show you json.load, but it looks like, okay, so you have to open the file object, but you don't have to read the file manually. You just pass the file object to json.load, and then that gives you a list. So maybe one extra step for reading it from a file, but it doesn't look too bad. Just a little bit of Googling. I think you can do it. I believe in you. Uh, does that answer your question? Do we have more questions? Uh, programmers got through their day very slowly before Googling was invented. Probably read a lot of books. I mean, also way back then, like there weren't like APIs so much. So you weren't dependent on other people's code that may or may not have been well-documented. Like generally, I think in the past, it was more common that everything you needed to write code was just included in your programming language. So you just had to read like the giant manual of like everything to know about C++. And that was all you needed to know to write your code. Uh, it's not like now where we have all these like frameworks and we have to look up their specific documentation when they were like, you know, written six months ago. So it's probably still under construction or whatever. Yeah. And forums and like email the serves people <laughs> probably use those a lot more. Yeah. All right. I think, I think we're good here.